To say that the 1970s was an interesting decade for true crime is an understatement. From historical logs, it seems as though murderers were more common in those days than they are today. Whether this is because there were more killers back then, or the increase in quality technology allowed for a more national database, the world sensationalized these cold-blooded criminals. While criminals from the United States tend to get the most publicity from this era, the rest of the world was not exempt from these horrendous crimes. In fact, there were five days in Australia where one man and his assembled gang would target innocent people until they were finally caught. Archibald McCafferty, better known as Archie Mad Dog McCafferty, is often referred to as Australia's Charles Manson, though there are some notable differences. Once just a morbid little boy, Archie would grow up to be one of the most notorious criminals in Australian history. Buckle up and prepare yourself for a tragic ride. From start to finish, let's hear the tale of Archie McCafferty and the victims he would claim over the course of five days. Originally born in Scotland, there's not much information to be found about the childhood of McCafferty. What is known about his childhood is that he immigrated to Australia with his parents when he was 10 years old. Also recorded would be umpteen times McCafferty would be institutionalized because of his terrible behavior. Before he was even into adulthood, he had dozens of crimes and violations under his belt. Whether it be breaking into and robbing a house or stealing a car, McCafferty's bill was certainly not clean. While McCafferty had not yet escalated to murder by this point in his life, he did tell psychiatrists about his enjoyment of strangling small animals. It was a morbid fascination of his, and no animal was safe. It could be puppies, kittens, or any small animal he could get his hands on. When questioned why he would do these things, McCafferty stated that he wanted to know what strangling the animals would feel like. Despite his questionable childhood and adolescence, McCaffrey would go on to marry a young woman named Janet. It would be long after they got married that Janet would become pregnant, but McCafferty's behavior didn't change. In fact, as he grew into an adult, he would get drunk or be under the influence of drugs often. While under the influence of either alcohol or drugs, he would get a violent streak. The anger he felt would then be taken out on his wife. He would alternate between beating and strangling her, allowing her to breathe only when she was on the verge of passing out. Far from a person worthy of pity, it should be mentioned McCaffrey could see how his violent tendencies were monstrous. He would often check into psych wards looking for help after a violent episode, but it never lasted. Only a short amount of time would pass before he would check out of the psych ward again, reverting back to his violent tendencies as if he never sought help in the first place. His wife would go on to give birth to a son, who they named Craig. Some sources mention McCafferty's mother saying he changed after the birth, but McCafferty's wife would counter this. To his wife, there would be no change in McCafferty until the untimely and tragic demise of their child. Craig McCafferty was less than two months old at the time of his tragic passing. Janet, a new mother, who was also dealing with an abusive husband, brought her baby into her bedroom to allow him to feed. As she began nursing him on her bed, she grew unbearably tired and eventually fell asleep. It would be during her deep slumber that she rolled over and suffocated her son. This accident would lead to some of the darkest days that McCafferty had ever experienced. After Craig's funeral, McCafferty would start an argument with Janet, accusing her of murdering their son on purpose. The young wife and heartbroken mother would flee from her abusive husband and go to her mother's house for safety. In the months that followed between the death of Craig and the inquest into her son's death, McCafferty would add a tattoo to his already impressive collection. This tattoo would be the number seven tattoo on the webbing between his index finger and his thumb. The number was not only McCafferty's favorite number, but it was also the number of people he believed he would need to kill to bring his son back. McCafferty would become angrier over time, going as far as to hurl bricks with harassing messages into the home his estranged wife resided in with her mother and her mother's boyfriend. This would occur the night before the day of the inquest into his son's death. Prior to throwing the bricks, McCafferty had already gathered a gang of accomplices. After Janet had fled, there were scenes of violence between Janet's loved ones and McCafferty that led McCafferty to go to his own parents' house. His mother would plead with him to go to the psych ward, which he did. Like all the other times though, it didn't last long, and soon he was checking himself out again. He would meet two women from the psych ward though that he would live with after they left the facility. One of those women was Carol Howes, a 26-year-old estranged mother of three who had tried to take her own life multiple times in the prior years. The other was 16-year-old Julie Ann Todd, whom the two adults took in after leaving the facility as she had nowhere else to go. This unstable trio would go on to also recruit three 17-year-old boys. The names of the boys were Michael John Meredith, Richard William Whittington, and Donald Richard Webster. It was August 24th of 1973, the first day of the inquest into Craig's death, when McCafferty killed for the first time. 
From the account of the story, murder wasn't the motive originally. McCafferty and his gang were cruising around looking for someone to rob in a stolen Volkswagen when they stumbled across 50-year-old George Anson. George Anson was a newspaper vendor who would drink at the hotel after his shift. A World War II veteran, he was walking home drunk when the gang pulled the car over. Anson was dragged into the street, beaten and robbed by McCafferty. Whether or not this would have been the end of it is unknown, as Anson would insult McCaffrey, sending McCafferty into a rage. The rage McCafferty felt led him to beating the 50-year-old man more before producing a knife and stabbing him seven times. Upon returning to the car, Webster was the only one to ask McCafferty why he killed the man. McCafferty answered that the man had insulted him, but the question caused McCafferty to be very suspicious of Webster from that moment forward. He was so suspicious that Webster was added to his hit list. Three more days would pass before the gang would patrol for another victim. This time, McCafferty wanted to stay at the gravesite of his son. He had begun hearing what he believed to be the voice of his son speaking to him, telling him he must kill seven people to bring him, his son, back from the dead. This would only cement his belief, placing murdering six more people at the top of his list. While McCafferty was at the gravesite, Julie Ann Todd and Michael John Meredith acted as hitchhikers. A good Samaritan would fall victim to the scheme, pulling over to pick the teens up to get them out of the rain. When the teens got into the vehicle, they held the man, 42-year-old Ronald Neal Cox, at gunpoint and instructed him to drive to the graveyard. When the car was arriving, McCafferty stepped away from his son's grave to meet his accomplices. Cox was pulled from the car and put face down into the mud. While on the ground, he had two shotguns pointed at him, one for McCafferty and one for Meredith. Cox would beg for his life, looking for mercy, as he was the father of seven children. This piece of knowledge proved to be a mistake, as hearing the number seven, both McCafferty and Meredith pulled their triggers, sending two bullets into the back of Cox's head, killing him. This kill wasn't enough to satisfy McCafferty's need for violence. Having heard what he believed to be the voice of his son encouraging him to kill seven people to bring him back from the dead, McCafferty sent Todd once again and Richard William Whittington out to hitchhike and find another victim. This would work again, this time finding a victim that was 24 years old. Evangelos Kolias was held at gunpoint, and the two accomplices would return to their leader with both the victim and the car. McCafferty would take control of the car, beginning to drive with the victim lying on the floorboards of the back seat. As the vehicle was in motion, McCafferty told Whittington to shoot and kill Kolias. Whittington wasn't sure if he could, but his hesitation ended with prodding from McCafferty. Whittington shot the innocent man in the back of the head once, and then a second time at McCafferty's demand. They dumped the body of the dead man onto the side of the road and continued driving. McCafferty had a plan in mind, completely engrossed in the idea of finding his estranged wife, her mother, and her mother's boyfriend, and murdering all three of them. If McCafferty killed those three on top of the three people he had already killed, he would only need one more murder to bring his dead son back. He had already decided that for his seventh kill, he would kill gang member Webster. This plan would not come to fruition, however. Their victim's car did not have enough gas to make it to their destination. Because of this, McCafferty's murder spree was delayed, ultimately sparing the life of four individuals. When one of the other members let Webster know he was on McCafferty's hit list, Webster began to act more cautiously, keeping an eye out for any danger. This would come in handy as he would notice McCafferty, Meredith, and Whittington outside his place of work, waiting for him to come out soon after. Webster knew he was in danger and had someone call the police. When detectives arrived, Webster told his story and backup was called. The area was quickly blocked off with McCafferty, Meredith, and Whittington being in police custody soon after. All six members of the gang would be put on trial. The three 17-year-old boys would all be found guilty of some crime. Meredith and Whittington would get 18 years each for the murders of Cox and Coleus. While Webster received four years after being found guilty of manslaughter, Julie Ann Todd was found guilty of murder and sentenced to 10 years in prison. However, less than a year after the horrific events, she would be found dead from suicide, having only recently turned 17 years old. Carol Howes was found not guilty on all charges and was eight months pregnant with the child of McCafferty. When McCafferty was found guilty of all three murders and given three life sentences, she promised she would wait for him, though it doesn't seem she would appear in McCafferty's life again. While in prison, McCafferty was kept on nearly four times the average dose of tranquilizers, even then still being rather violent. He would have his troubles while in prison, even being found guilty of manslaughter in 1981, adding 14 more years to his sentence. This is something that McCafferty would fight against, saying that he was set up and framed. McCafferty, after this, would begin to tell officials of illegal activity that was happening between prisoners and guards. By providing this sensitive information, he put himself at risk 
and was put into the Witness Protection Program. In the years before his parole, McCafferty became what was described as a perfect prisoner. His behavior shifted, and he claimed that he was a changed man. He would be paroled in 1997, but would not be free to travel on Australian land. Instead, McCafferty would be deported back to Scotland, a country he had not known as home since his youth. Since being paroled and deported to Scotland back in 1997, McCafferty would have several more run-ins with the law. News headlines stating that he had threatened police officers, slashed a knife at his new wife, held his child hostage, and been found driving a stolen car would periodically appear for the next 10 years. Aside from that, a news article speaks of him helping with his partner's shop. He would get irritated at reporters, telling them that he was trying to live a normal life and that he had committed his crime so long ago. Nearly half a century later, it may be safe to say that McCafferty's reign of terror really has come to an end. Thanks so much for listening. Let us know what you thought in the comments below.